Okay. Uh, welcome to my podcast. I just want to uh, thank, thank everybody for joining. Um, this will be repurposed on YouTube uh, eventually. So if you don't catch it live, you'll be able to see the repeat. Um, I'd just like to welcome my guest and um, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your journey with dogs. Well, thanks for inviting me on. Uh, my name is Brandon Johnson. Um, I'm the owner of Bodybuilder Bulldogs. Um, we raise old English bulldogs, which for a lot of people, they confuse with the English bulldog breed. And they are very similar yet different. Um, for the, the simplest way I know how to describe it is that oldies are a supposed to be a healthier, a little bit more athletic version of an English bulldog. They're recreation of a breed that went extinct when the, when the sport bull baiting was outlawed. And so that's, that's what we specialize in. That's all we do. We've, we've had some other breeds in the past, but have settled on oldies. It's kind of our passion and what we feel like we're the best at. And we've been doing that for about a decade. So I, again, I appreciate you inviting me to come on. Yeah, no doubt. What, uh, what other breeds did you have prior to old English and what was the deciding factor that said, this is the breed for me? That's a great question. Uh, we started with, uh, Bull, uh, with uh, English Mastiffs. We had a pair of those for a while, had a couple of litters, really cool dogs, neat dogs, but frankly, they'll eat you out of house and home <laughs> if you have very many of them. Um, really, we really loved the breed. Um, we also had English Bulldogs for a while, um, really struggled with that. It was not my strength. Um, that market is completely different than, than the old English Bulldog market. And it has gone so heavy into the rare color uh, craze that, uh, man, it, it just was basically all about color. And so we ended up getting out of that. We, we really love the oldies because if you have an artistic mind or you want to create something, it's one of the few areas in the dog world that you can actually do that. Since it's a recreation of a breed that went extinct, it's still in the process of uh being created or having the type set. There is a, there's a breed standard. Um, the registries have a breed standard out there, but you're still allowed actually in some cases to outcross. Um, that's being more and more limited and probably will cease here before long with most registries. But up until recently, you could still breed directly to an English bulldog or directly to an American bulldog or whatever you felt like your lines needed to create your own type, uh, to create your own line freedom rather than just breeding something that already had type stamped into it uh, with an oldie you could actually create your own uh, your own line with your own vision and with uh, your own style and that was really what drew us to it uh, we got into it just because we liked bulldogs and they were a healthier version of the breed and so that excited us as well um, they can typically natural whelp which was a, a great plus when you first get into breeding and you don't have a lot of experience uh, but man, yeah, we got into it, man, over a decade ago, I guess it would have been back in 2012. And um, we got started just with a couple of dogs, moved up to three or four dogs. And then I ran into a guy I consider my mentor. Uh, his name is Chris Moore. Uh, his kennel name used to be Bulky Built. Um, I think it's I Bulldogs now. He and his wife, uh, Gina, um, taught me so much over the years. Chris is just a wealth of knowledge. He's a, a judge and an oldie breeder. He's, but yeah, Chris and Gina were just a really big help. Um, taught me so much about genetics, uh, about how to achieve certain looks, certain types, certain traits. Uh, taught me how to lock in a type. Uh, might be something we discuss later on, but just so many things in the bulldog game. They, they were one of the few people that I ran across in the dog game at that time that uh, they weren't kennel blind. They would freely point out the flaws in their own dogs and what needed to improve. And that helped me to develop uh, the ability to see flaws in my own dogs and see where improvement needed to be. So, and, and just them given uh, kind of lighting and excitement in me about building my own line and uh, of, my, of my own dogs that didn't just look like everybody else's, but really stood out as my own brand basically. Um, it's really what led me to uh, the oldies and has kept me there for so long. Can you talk about like the, the differences be between uh, 
breeding English Mastiffs and Oldie Bulldogs? And what are some of the uh, difficulties that you've come across with uh, Old Englishes? Sure. I'm definitely not an expert in English Mastiffs. We did a couple of litters. Um, it was it was like breeding some of the other uh, dogs that you come across that the type is completely stamped in. Um, and so you can pretty well take any two dogs, breed them together from that breed, and you're going to get similar looking puppies. Uh, oldies is a whole different ball game because you still have so many mixed genetics, so many mixed uh, genotypes and phenotypes uh, that it's hard to achieve consistency. Um, but that's actually what we've kind of built our program on is that we feel like we, we are being much more consistent in our dog's look compared to definitely compared to where we were in the past, but compared to a lot of what's out there, um, you can identify a bodybuilder bulldog. Typically when you see one without anybody telling you where it came from, if, if you're familiar with our, with our kennel. Um, and so th that can really frustrate some breeders in the oldie world. And it's been difficult for us to achieve consistency. Uh, when we first started, you, we'd have a litter of puppies and you'd have a couple of puppies in a litter that look like English bulldogs. And you'd have two or three puppies in there that look like old English bulldogs. And you'd have a couple of puppies that look like an American bulldog. And then you'd have one outlier that looked like a pit bull. And, uh, it, it could really be frustrating when you're trying to achieve consistency and, and you just have this scattering of types throughout a litter. Uh, so that has been a real challenge. We have we have overcome that with time through uh, line breeding and through really focusing on certain types and traits and features that we need. But uh, I would say for a lot of people, that has been a frustration. It definitely was for us. Uh, that has gotten so much better just in the last five or six years. We're seeing a lot more consistency uh, throughout the breed, but there still is a lot of inconsistency compared to some of the breeds that have been established for centuries. Right. And could you kind of talk about the history of the Old English and, and what were the, the breeds behind it and what was the philosophy of recreating um, the old style English Bulldogs? Sure. Great question. Well, they were originally used um, for the sport of bull baiting, which has been outlawed a long time ago. Um, they, were, they were used as fighting dogs in the arena. And when that was outlawed, they really no longer had a purpose in that time and culture. And so they uh, basically went extinct over time because there was no purpose in breeding. Um, back in the 70s, I believe it was, uh, a guy decided to recreate them, Mr. Levitt, and he began to mix different genetics from different breeds. And the whole purpose was, was to create a healthier, more functional uh, bulldog. Uh, the English bulldog has never been you know, extremely functional, uh, but especially as we've gotten further, further into the more extreme dogs, which we see throughout many different breeds, not just English bulldogs, mm -hmm. they've become less and less functional. Um, and he wanted to, to recreate that, that bulldog that was athletic, that had drive, that could work, uh, that had stamina and was more healthy and, and a little bit more free of those uh, health issues. And so back in the seventies, he started mixing genetics. Um, and it depends on which line you look at or that you go to. There are lines that contain pit bulls, uh, bull mastiff, American bulldog. The, typically the foundation breed is still English bulldog. You'll find some rare stuff where people have mixed in uh, staffy bulls and, and different things like that. Um, but for the most part, you're dealing with approximately a 50% English bulldog base with sometimes bull mastiff, sometimes pit bull, sometimes American bulldog uh, mixed in to give it more athleticism, typically a little bit more size, um, and to help wash out some of those health issues that have really become bred into the English bulldog breed over time. Now, I understand there are some English bulldogs uh, that have that are really healthy, but for overall, the breed has been known for being not very healthy. And so the oldie, through these breeding processes and mixing in these other breeds, we've tried to establish or create a breed that is a little bit healthier and has more stamina and drive. Right. And let's talk about the standard that you are trying to lock in and, and on your yard and, and what's the philosophy behind that? Sure. 
My dogs typically are going to be a little bit more on the extreme side of the scale compared to some other breeders. Um, there is so much diversity amongst old English bulldogs. You will, and, and I'm not bashing anyone, um, and everybody has their kind of their own vision and their own purpose, and they serve a niche, and that's great. Um, but you will see throughout the old English bulldog breed, you will see everything from one end of the scale that looks really similar to a boxer or a really lean American bulldog, all the way down to stuff that looks um, really similar, sometimes indiscernible from an English bulldog and everything in between. There's stuff that's really heavy on the American bulldog side of things. You'll see stuff that has a lot of a pit influence. Uh, my stuff is more on the extreme side. And, and what I mean by extreme is things that uh, we, we breed for a dog that's really girthy. Um, we, the breed standard uh, describes the dog as having a well-sprung rib cage. And you're going to see a lot of oldies out there that don't have as much rib cage as what we like. We like a really well-sprung dog. I want a dog with a really wide chest. We want really good bone. Um, we like the really big round headpiece. Um, cheekbone is something that we really strive to get. And we want that cheekbone, but we also want it with that really square muzzle type. Um, to, what I tell most people when they ask me, what, what do I breed for in an old English bulldog? I tell people, I want people to know when they see it, it's a bulldog. Because um, sometimes you can't tell with oldies um, that they have gone so far one way to, to be athletic and healthy that they no longer resemble a bulldog. And if, if we're breeding for something, for a dog that's just athletic and healthy, then there's no sense in it being a bulldog in the first place. Um, we, tr we strive for health, we strive for athleticism, but we're willing to sacrifice a little bit on the athleticism side to have that dog that really encompasses the characteristics of a bulldog, girth, shoulders, big head, nice bone. Um, and so we try to incorporate that in, in a dog that really kind of has the wow factor and yet still is functional, still is healthy, can handle the heat better than an English bulldog. And we strive for that whole package. We don't always achieve it in every litter, but that's, that's what we strive for is that dog that really has the wow factor when you see it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the oldies actually have a pretty wide um, standard as far as size goes. In fact, I believe the breed standard even says that if, if you're in the show ring or the standard allows for actually shorter and less weight, as long as the dog is proportionate to the, in scale, um, they actually allow you to be a little bit shorter and a little bit um, lighter than what the standard actually calls for. But we shoot for typically a dog that's between 16 and 18 inches at the shoulders, um, weighs between 50 and 80 pounds. Um, our average uh, for a male is typically about a 65 to 75 pound dog. Um, we, we try not to get over that 18 inch um, height just because the, the taller you get, it's really hard to carry those other bulldog features. Um, I've seen a few and I had a couple, I've, we've had a really a couple of really nice stud dogs that were in the 19 inch range um, that really exhibited all the features we wanted. Uh, but typically our stuff's a little bit more on the smaller side and they do really good in, in family uh, pet homes too, which is always nice. You, you get a hundred, 120 pound dog and that don't all, they don't always mix well with a family with toddlers. Yeah. What are some of the breeds that you have used on a consistent basis besides English Bulldogs to, to kind of lock in your, you know, distinct look? Uh, great question. It's, that's a struggle. Um, we have, we have used Bull Mastiff. Um, thankfully we had a source uh, through Chris uh, Moore uh, for English Massive that had already been watered down some with English Bulldog, because when you mix in other breeds, you, you, you're trying to achieve or to obtain a certain trait, which is great, but you always, you always get other traits that you don't desire. And oftentimes the other traits that come along with the ones that you want are almost not worth um, going out and to use the other breeds. It's almost like they bring in more problems than they solve. Um, so we use Bull Massive, which is great. It adds really clean structure, um, adds some really nice bone. Head type is not where I want to be with a with an oldie when you bring in Mastiff. So you do struggle with that a little bit. You oftentimes lose cheekbone. You get that more blocky square head instead of the round head. Um, and so I, I love Mastiff for some of the stuff that it brings. Um, it's also something that you don't see in a lot of, in a lot of oldie lines. It's, it is out there, but you don't see it as much. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a distinctive look. 
Um, we have used English Bulldog pretty heavy when we first started. We have since moved away from that. Um, and the reason for that is because oftentimes oldies lack type. They, as I said earlier, they just don't look like a bulldog. And the only way to really achieve that consistently is to go back to an English Bulldog. Uh, I can remember my foundation stud. He was about seven eighths English Bulldog with about one eighth Mastiff. Now he was too much English Bulldog, but we needed that to lock in type on our breedings for other generations, for the future generations. We needed him to lock that in. Uh, at that point, once we had really locked in that English Bulldog type, we went out a little bit with the American Bulldog, which is which is really great if you find the right one. That's one thing that we learned in breeding oldies is it's not always about bringing in a specific breed. Oftentimes it's more about reaching out outside of your breed and finding the specific dog. Um, American Bulldog is great if you can find the right one. Bull Mastiff is good. Um, they're a little bit more consistent, but throughout the Americans, you'll see a lot of variation. There's the really clean show dogs, then you find the more extreme ones. And when you use an American with with oldies, you really need that dog that has really heavy cheekbone, a, a really nice head. And it's great if you can find an American that has ex excessive bone, uh, because a lot of times my experience has been when you mix in the American, you lose some of that bone. And so you, you might gain whatever feature it is you're looking for, but you have lost bone sometimes for a generation or two. And you have to go backwards, oftentimes back to an English bulldog to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we've done that. We even once used uh, American Bully. And that was interesting. It, uh, it definitely achieved some things. It also set us back multiple generations on that breeding. Um, Chris once said to me when we talked about using American Bully, he said, it's like oil and water. You can always see the influence. And he was right. Uh, when you mix it in, there were certain traits that you got that you wanted, but there was always that, that American Bully feature typically uh in the head type that was really really hard to wash out it never it never really mixed it really just kind of stuck out which was not what we were going for you want to get those certain features but get them to mix and blend really pretty into a single animal and uh, we really struggled when we used american bully to get that to work so i would say my experience has been english bulldogs the easiest bull mastiffs probably next and then uh, american bulldog and lastly get into the pits or the american bullies are the most difficult or it has been for me to mix in mm -hmm. and have you used uh, a little bit of pit every once in a while or some amstaff or i never have i've never been that brave <laughs> um just from other things I've heard from other breeders. And we always felt like when you, when we've used breeds like that, it you oftentimes lose that mass and the girth so quickly that it that it it's just not worth the it's not worth the what you might gain. Mm -hmm. uh, typically I can find another oldie or I can find something else to bring those traits that I want uh, rather than mix in something I feel like is going to set me too far back. Right. And what are the registries that you uh, you go through? Um, we have used two. There's two really big registries in the Old English Bulldog. Um, the oldest and probably most recognized one is the International Old English Bulldog Association, um, referred to as IOEBA. Uh, they're based out of Missouri. Um, that's who I use. Um, great breeder or, or great registry, been around for years. Uh, like all registries, they kind of have gone through cycles. They're they're not AKC by any means. They're a family run business, but uh, they do care about the the breeders in their registry, which is great. Um, sometimes you've I've felt like in the past with registries, you're just a name or a number, and IWBA really does care about their breeders and helps uh, helps them uh, with registrations and questions and. Um, if you lose a registration or you have a client who calls you five years later and they've lost their their puppy paperwork, you know, they'll help you get your stuff. Uh, the other main one who I've also used and, and had good luck with is uh, the ABKC, American Bully Kennel Club. Um, they've really got big into oldies not too long after after we really went um, went into oldies pretty heavy. It was it's been close to a decade ago and we used them for years, still use them some. Um, they're a great registry if you're really into the show ring. Uh, they have a lot more shows, a lot more opportunities if you want to get your dog out. 
and try to get it champed out. Whereas Iowa BA shows uh, and their show opportunities are much more limited. Uh, but those are the, the two main ones. There's several other small ones out there, and there's a few of the bigger registries that have also picked them up. Um, but the two main ones are IOEBA and ABKC. And do you uh, have you ever partaked in uh, the show ring? I personally have have shown one time. Um, I am not opposed to it by any means, but like many competitive sports or many competitive things, there can be a lot of politics. Um, and I, I just don't do drama well. <laughs> and so I have chosen to put my focus and my energy into my kennel and into my breeding program and into the, the dogs rather than into the show ring. And with, uh, I've got a, I'm married and have four kids also have another business that I run. I just don't have time to run all over the country. I have dogs that my clients have bought from me that have champed out. Um, and so, I mean, we have dogs that have been in the show ring. It's just not my forte. Yeah, no doubt. Can you talk about the, uh, IOEBA, um, uh, standards and how that matches with your, your yard? Sure. They, they have pretty much the same standard as ABKC. Uh, my dogs are going to be on the smaller end of their standard. Um, their standard, I think I'll have to, I'd have to check, but I think it lists up to a 21 inch dog. Um, we don't breed anything near that big. Um, they also, they're really, they're really um, definitive on really clean structure, uh, which is a great thing. I mean, you, you definitely want a dog that can function. Uh, on our side of things, when we breed, we definitely want dogs that can function and that have good structure, but we're willing to fudge a little bit to have the dog that carries that type that we want. We're willing to have a dog that might be a little weak in the pasterns. Uh, again, we, we want a dog that we don't want a dog that's, that can't function, that can't walk, things like that. We're not talking about issues where, where the dog has health issues, but we're willing to have a dog with a little bit weaker pasterns that might get docked a point or two in the show ring. But that when people see it, they see it as a bulldog. Um, I've I've seen some dogs um, rip, champ out and be grand champions or national winners that, frankly, I personally wouldn't wouldn't own or breed. Um, structurally flawless dogs, absolutely structurally flawless, um, beautiful movement. But if you were to take them out on the street, your average person wouldn't know they were a bulldog. And my own personal vision. Again, not, not uh, judging or putting anyone else's uh, vision or their breeding program down, but my own personal vision is if someone can't tell what my production is a bulldog, I feel like I've failed. And so we, we, use, the, uh, we use the standard as a guide, and that's what we shoot for is a dog that fits in that standard, but also recognizing that our dog needs to exhibit a type that's recognizable to us and and our society as a bulldog and if we haven't done that we feel like we failed mm -hmm. can you talk about like the the personality differences between a pure english bulldog and an old english on your you, yard you bet you bet yeah there's also a lot of variation throughout breeders um with oldies when it comes to temperament uh there are there are some breeders out there that breed for a working dog temperament that's not my thing um, I love to see dogs work, uh, but working dogs are high needs and, and you have to really keep them going and, and they, they can make family pets, but you got to have a job for them. And we breed for a pet mentality is what I tell people. Um, we breed for a dog. One of the analogies that Chris uh, taught me years ago, and I have adopted it as my own, is that we breed linebackers. We don't breed wide receivers. Wide receivers can run forever and they're long and lean. Linebackers are, are thick and square and they're really quick and really agile and really athletic, but don't ask them to run for long distances. And so that's, that's what we breed for is a dog that has that athleticism and can, has, can be quick, they can function, but also has that pet mentality that, hey, after 45 minutes to an hour in the yard, they are so thrilled to crash with you on the couch. Mm -hmm. um, we have pets that sometimes live in apartments all the way out to people on 160 acre farms and their, their dogs go with them. We get pictures back sometimes from people who have taken their dogs to Colorado and, and hike partway up the mountain, which is great. 
but we breed for a dog that has that that pet temperament, willing to you know go with you and your family to school, um, sit on your couch, go to the park and play fetch. Uh, my dogs go through about a pack of tennis balls every two or three days because they just they love to, the fetch and and play uh, play with their balls. But at the same time, uh, we're not striving to produce a dog that has to be worked, that has high drive and high energy. Uh, we want something that is a, is a family pet. And again, nothing against people who breed for that. That's just not the style that we breed for. Frankly, it's not the type of dog that I like. Um, I like that dog that's a little easier going, uh, that you don't have to uh, make sure that they're busy so they're not destroying something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> how important, uh, you kind of touched upon it earlier, but how important is is color in your program? It, it is. It is important. Um Anybody who breeds and is not independently wealthy and who is going to be honest with you will tell you that, that money plays a part in breeding dogs because breeding dogs is not a cheap endeavor. Um, and the market out there uh, right now and has been for years is that rare colors are in high demand. They bring more money and they look cool. And, and luckily amongst the oldie standard, it allows for some of these rare colors that you see out there today. And so we've incorporated those. Um, but I think something that's important to always remember in any breed when it comes to color is that it's it's icing on the cake. It's not the cake itself. And um, it's easy to chase color and lose type, lose health, lose structure. And so we have incorporated it, but there have been times when we might have been behind the curve a little bit. Uh, because we didn't see a, a way to incorporate whatever color it was that we wanted and still produce a style of dog that we were proud to call a bodybuilder bulldog. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, that's kind of how we've graded ourselves. Um, if it wasn't something we were proud to say, hey, we, we produced that, um, then, then we failed and we need to do something different. Um, we've, we worked for years and years to, to make a, 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 some lilac tri old English bulldogs, and, th and there were plenty out there. Um, they were out there when I started. They were just kind of coming on the scene um, in 2014. Uh, I know Willie at Full of Bulls had a litter of, I think it was an entire litter of lilac tries. And they were kind of the, some of the first ones to hit the market and get out into the into other breeders' hands. We were significantly behind that. Um, and Willie's dogs were nice. It, what, the first major stud I owned was from Full of Bulls. And uh, Willie... Uh, made a beautiful dog out of it uh, from him. We used him in our kennel. Uh, but for years, there were a lot of lilac tries out there that I would not, I wouldn't own. Not because there was anything wrong with the dog per se, but it just didn't, it didn't have the type or it wouldn't, wouldn't be something I would want to say, hey, I produced that. It didn't go along with my vision. And so, yes, color is, is something we've incorporated. We have merles, we have tries, we have blues, we have chocolates, we have lilacs. Um, but it's taken us years and it's taken time to get to where we could produce dogs of rare color that we were proud to say were ours. And it's still, it's a continual work in progress. Um, I, I've heard it said and believe that it's true. There's no such thing as a perfect dog. And throughout my decade or more of doing this, I've come to that conclusion. There's always somewhere to improve. And so, yeah, we've brought color in, we're using it. It's definitely important in our breeding process. Uh, but it's not the first factor when we breed. It is a factor, but it's not the first one. Um, there are things that are more important, structure, health, uh, overall type, things like that to, that come into play before we, we choose color. But at the end of the day, if we're, if we're doing a breeding and we got two studs that are candidates and, and one of them is a standard color dog and the other one is a, is a rare color dog and we feel like they're equal uh, in what they bring to the table, we're going to go with the rare color dog every time. That's, that's a great question. I get, I get asked that quite a bit from people who are getting into the bulldog game. We have done everything from putting two dogs in a pen and let them natural tie all the way up to, um, I have never used frozen semen. I have frozen semen um, in storage off of my own boys, but I have never used it yet. We actually have plans to probably in the next year or two. Um, but we also have done many chilled semen breedings that we have done surgically. Um, we almost always do progesterone testing. Um, my experience has been uh, natural breeding is great when you have a really experienced stud dog that knows what he's doing. 
um, and you have a female who's going to cooperate. I would say for me, that happens about 25% of the time. And I don't like being set back six months, a year, 18 months, because my stud dog wasn't, uh, it wasn't skilled enough to get the breeding done or my timing was off or my female wouldn't cooperate. So we do a lot of artificial breedings. Um, I'll do my, I've done plenty of AIs at home. We have all of our own supplies, pipettes, uh, microscope, all that stuff. We can do some semen evaluation as well. We also are blessed to live about 35 minutes from a reproductive specialist. He's actually kind of known as the reproduct bulldog reproductive specialist kind of the main one in the country, um, town and country vet in Shawnee, Oklahoma, uh, Joel Wilson is his name. And he has been such a resource. I've learned so much from him and his technician uh, about all things, breeding dogs and problems, how to overcome some of those things. Um, it's just been, it's really been a blessing to have him and him be willing to share knowledge and, and walk me through things. We progesterone test basically every female that we breed. Um, I found over the years, it's not just more successful, but it takes a lot of the stress and the guessing out of it. Um, it's less stress on your stud dog. Um, you're not putting him in a situation, especially in the summer when you're dealing with bulldogs, you're not putting him in a situation where you're expecting him to perform three times or four times in the heat next being pinned with a girl in the heat, him getting excited and worked up. Um, I, I just love the process of, of progesterone test. You know exactly what it is. The science doesn't lie you can narrow it down to a three day window and, and you know, once that breeding takes place, you as a breeder have done everything you can do to make it a successful process. And so uh, we, we do a lot of progesterone testing. Probably I would say basically every breeding we do now, we use progesterone testing. Uh, we do a lot of surgical AIs. Um, a lot of times we have learned that bulldog anatomy makes it, difficult for a side-by-side -side AI or at-home AI or standard AI, whatever term you want to use to be successful. My, my own success rate has been about 50, 50. Um, and so we do a lot of surgicals or uh, TCI, the trans cervical insemination. And we just have a lot more success going that route. Um, I know a lot of people frown on surgical insemination. They put your dog under to do that. What they don't take into consideration, especially uh, natural breeding bulldogs is, is it's a workout for them. If you're, especially if you're doing it in the summer, um, it, yes, you're putting under a female, but you're also putting way less stress on your stud dog. Uh, after doing this for a decade, I have never once lost a dog on an operating table. Uh, if you have a good vet that knows what they're doing, most of the time, that's not an issue. There are exceptions, but most of the time that's not been an issue for me. Uh, whelping is, is a fun process. Um, I tell my wife that, uh, the dog business has aged me just from uh, whelping puppies, uh, the all night process and being up multiple times in a row. It seems like uh, they always come in at the same time. Females, if you have a kennel of more than two or three dogs, they're going to come in in batches. And our females come in sometimes two or three or four at a time. So I've had six weeks in a row sometimes where you just have one litter after the other and you don't sleep through the night for six or seven weeks and you're just a walking zombie <laughs> you know once you get to the end of that you're you're uh, seeing visions and just trying to stay upright but uh that it, it's a fun process i have four kids and they're involved in the care of of our dogs from the time puppies hit the ground until uh, they leave and they help with the kennels and our adult dogs as well so it's a, it's a real blessing to have them around. I tell people freely, I couldn't do it on the scale that I do it without them or without hiring someone. Uh, just because a lot of people, they just see the social media or they just see pictures and they say, oh, puppies, how wonderful that is. And they don't know the hours and hours of work, and sweat and, and worry and anxiety and stress that goes into to breeding and raising dogs. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, you have to love it in order to do it, uh, it, it'll just wear you out if, if nothing else. And, and then, you know, you, you get attached or you have a, a newborn litter and you work so hard, uh, to get them up and get them going. And then you have one that just fades. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people, and there's a lot of discussion about, uh, fading puppy syndrome and what causes that. I have my own thoughts about that, but 
uh, you know, to lose a little one after you put so much, not just financial resources into it, but so much of your own time and effort and, and you're trying to, to get them to live and then you lose one, that's just gut wrenching. Um, I've known a lot of breeders quit just having to go through that process, but the reward, the, the rewarding side is great too. Um, we have uh, facilities where they start in the house with me. Uh, we have, we built an add on to our house about three years ago. And in that add on, we built a special laundry room with, with a special washing machine just for the dogs and their laundry. Uh, we have our own whelping closet that uh, I can sleep right next to it uh, with puppy guardrails. And uh, so mama's in typically in here in the house with me uh, at least for the first two, two and a half weeks. And then we have a couple of uh, whelping facilities here on the property that climate controlled and all that. Once we feel like they're big enough that mama's not going to lay on them and squash them, that uh, we'll move them to the whelping facilities with mama until they are weaning age. And then we, we go through the weaning process, which is always, always fun. But uh, that, that's the, I guess the long answer to your question. It's, it's a, it's a process. We love it, but man, it is a lot of work. We, uh, we have had pretty good success with our mamas and, uh, and their mothering instinct. Um, it is a learned thing. We have learned that ourselves over time that sometimes you'll have a, a mama and she'll have a litter. And that first litter, you say, I'm never going to breed this dog again. You know, this was so much work. She didn't clean. She didn't want to lay down and feed him. She wasn't attentive. She wasn't careful where she laid down or where she stepped. Um, and then when it comes around for the time for the next breeding, you think, man, those puppies were beautiful by the time they were eight weeks old. Maybe we'll try one more time. And that second litter is completely different. There, there is a learned uh, part of the mothering aspect. And, and I do tell some breeders that, that it's easy to get disheartened if you have a bad mama. And, and there are some that are just disinterested moms. They just do not care. Um, but for the most part, a lot of times it's a learned process. And if you can be patient and help them work through that, um, I, I do intervene a lot more probably than some breeders do. Um, it, it's just crushing to lose a puppy, uh, not only on the financial side of things, but it's, it's crushing emotionally that after all the work and effort you put in to lose a little one. And so um, I, sit, I typically don't leave my mom as unsupervised until puppies get to two weeks old. I sit with them. We feed during intervals. Um, if it's one that I trust, she's had multiple litters, I'll leave her with puppies unsupervised for 15 or 20 minutes at a time. But typically only if I'm in earshot or, uh, you know, my wife or kids are within earshot. But overall, they're pretty good moms. Um, we, I wouldn't leave them, every single one of them, unsupervised and uh, you know, without some experience to, to know, uh, but they're not something that is disinterested in their puppies. Um, they, they mother, they clean for the most part. Um, every now and then you get one that's overly motherly and that can be just as much of a problem as one that's disinterested. Um, but on a scale of one to 10, I'd rate the breed overall, probably, uh, somewhere between a five and a seven on a mothering scale. Mm-hmm. And can you talk about um, the diet that you feed your dogs and what's the philosophy behind that? Sure. Uh, we, we feed uh, kibble. We have looked into and investigated the raw diet thing. Uh, we have chosen not to go that route uh, for two reasons. One, it's a, it's a lot of work and investment. Um, we have a pretty good sized kennel. Um, you know, we have usually between 10 and 12 adult females at any given time. Um, and that's a lot of grinding. Um, but more importantly, uh, a lot of people don't realize this who aren't breeders is they think, you, you know, dogs are descendant of wolves so, and they're carnivores. So you just throw them some meat and that that's not how it works. Uh, dogs have nutritional requirements that, uh, typically, uh, meat alone will not meet. Um, there are other things you have to add in. You have to be able to source those things so they get the nutrients they need in order, especially if you're dealing with puppies, for them to develop, but also when you're dealing with adults to keep them healthy. Um, it can be done. I'm not knocking the raw diet, but just for me, it's it's not a fit having to source green tripe and enough chicken and, and other items in order to add it to get what the dog needs. I know it definitely has some benefits, uh, just not been something we desire to do. We tried it to, to, uh, to feed, we've tried two or three, well, I've tried more than two or three over the years. Um, I'm a big fan of Purina Pro Plan. Uh, also a big fan of Victor. Both of those have done well for me. Um, they're a good quality food. They're not cheap, but they're not 
necessarily going to break the bank. Um, they are great if you're a kennel owner. The cleanup is a little bit less typically, especially if you feed Victor. It makes a really nice firm stool. Maybe some of the listeners didn't want to know that, but <laughs> if you've ever had to clean a kennel, um, you can learn to really appreciate a nice firm stool. Um, I am not a big fan of the grain free thing. Um, I know that there are some people that love it. And if that's your thing, no judgment from me. Um, but there is some research out there that, that indicates it's linked to some heart problems. Um, and so we chose not to go that route. Um, for the most part, we haven't had, we, our dogs don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of allergy issues. And so we can feed a lot of different things. Uh, we've occasionally had one and it, it, that had some allergies. And so we, we do like chicken and, and fish formulas that seem to, if you do happen to have a dog that has skin allergies, it's hard to beat the uh, pro plan salmon and rice formula. Um, it just, they do great on it. I've had dogs that wouldn't gain weight on anything other than uh, Purina pro plan salmon and rice, but it's also great for dogs that have skin issues as well. So um, I'm definitely not a nutritionist or a scientist, but that those are kind of what we look for and what we like um, for our kennel as well. What are some of the things that you've seen on your yard with allergies and how, how do you try to, to minimize that? Great question. We have learned a lot of times it's seasonal or regional. Um, I have seen dogs both come here and have allergy issues. And I've seen dogs leave here with no allergy issues and have issues in their new destination. And that, that just makes sense when you think about uh, even our own allergy issues as, as humans, that a lot of times they're due to a certain, uh, in, something in our environment locally. Um, and so if you can identify that, sometimes you can do something about it. Sometimes you can't, you know, if I have a dog that's allergic to red cedar here in the South, there's not a whole lot I can do for them. Um, find, uh, oftentimes I, I might have to find them a place somewhere else. And I, I've never had a dog allergic to red cedar, but just as an example that, um, so some of those things, uh, there's not a good answer for it other than you can go to your vet. You can, uh, you know, you can get some different hydrocortisone shots, things like that, uh, to deal with uh, your allergy issues. Um, we've had some that had, you know, the splotchy skin or splotchy hair, um, because they had a food allergy to, to beef or to sheep or something like that. And as you said, the, the salmon formula or fish formula has always been great for us. That, that does away with that. There have been, when I've had one or two throughout the years who had that issue, I would just switch the entire kennel <clears throat> over to a fish formula and the issue would go away. Um, but we, we also have had a time or two, I've had a girl who had really, uh, really gummy eyes and it is a seasonal thing. She would get gummy eyes starting about March or April here, and her eyes would be goopy throughout, you know, three or four months till you got to the middle of summer, clear up. She'd be great for the for the next eight, nine months. Um, and you could talk to a vet about it, and they will, they'll give you some options, but most of the time those are not financially responsible options. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's kind of like uh, dealing with our own allergies. You know, there are some things that you can help some things you can address that make sense. And there are some things that you either move or you just tough it out. Right. For sure. What are some of the, the health issues that um, you've run across and the things that you have to be aware of on, on, in your program and other programs uh, similar to yours that the old English is, um, is facing these days? Sure. Yeah. Great question. Uh, you know, I'd love to sit here and tell you that all English bulldogs are always healthy because that's the purpose of the breed was to be a healthier bulldog. Um, we, like anybody who's raised uh, oldies long enough, have had issues throughout the years that just happens. The way I try to explain it to most people is we have minimized a lot of the health issues, but you're still working off of a foundation uh, of an English bulldog. So number one, you're, you're going to have some of those issues. And then Secondly, you're, you're fighting mother nature. Mother nature wants to put a longer nose, less bone, less girth, less muscle mass, because that's what functions best out in nature. And so we are fighting that when we, and not, this is not just a bulldog thing. This is many different breeds. Uh, those specific traits that we're breeding for, we're fighting against mother nature. So in inherent in those things, are going to be some struggles. 
And we have learned to minimize those. We have learned to breed around some of those things, and, which is great. And, and that's that's a great thing about breeding is that we can always make improvements in those areas. Uh, but we have seen some things over time, small things. Um, cherry eye comes up sometimes. And a lot of people, times people freak out over the cherry eye thing. It's not a big deal. Um, it's a, my vet charges uh, like $100, $110 for a little minor surgery and never an issue again. Um, it's a little unsightly until you get it taken care of. Um, we've had that for a, with a litter or two in 10 years that's come up. And typically you learn uh, about some of these things that some of them run through a specific lineage that you that you find. But oftentimes there's some significant debate when you deal with cherry eye about how much of it is genetic and how much of it is environmental. Um, there's no doubt that part of it is genetic um, because my own experience has told me that, that there's a couple of dogs I've used over the years that consistently would produce a puppy or two or three in the litter with cherry eye. So I have no doubt that it's partly genetic, but I've also experienced it enough to know that I think at times it, it's also environmental. There's a, a breeder friend of mine who raised English bulldogs, does raise English bulldogs, has some of the best in the world, if you ask me, um, told me he, he lives out, uh, along a national forest and he tells would tell me every time that they would burn in the national forest he would have a dog or two pop a cherry eye and, and i've had some of the same similar experience with puppies who you know got in a squabble with a sibling maybe got their eye scratched maybe got overexcited because it is a blood pressure thing it kind of plays into it um so it, that's one of those things you know sometimes you hear oh it's cherry eye it's genetic well my experience has been i think it's kind of both I think there are dogs that are, you know, predisposed to it. And I think sometimes you have it occur because uh, the, the environment uh, aggravated it or definitely at least helped it uh, to be an issue. Um, we've rarely on a couple of occasions, we've had uh, hip dysplasia, which is also a bulldog thing. Now, this is over probably, uh, you know, a decade and probably close to 100 litters of puppies. So we're not talking about major issues, but hip, hip dysplasia happens from time to time. Um, and there's also some debate about how much of that is genetic versus how much of that is given a puppy the, the right footing and the, and the right um, the right surface to walk on. As they begin to walk, there's that need for the ball and socket to massage and work together to help that hip development. There's also no doubt that part of it's genetic as well. Um, but when you put puppies in situations where they can't get a firm footing and they can't get traction and they aren't able to work that ball and socket together during the developmental stage, there is some science that shows that that also plays into hip dysplasia. Um, there are some lines, depending on how much you breed into it or how much you line up on it, that have had some heart murmur issues. That's not a specific oldie issue. There are other breeds that have that as well. Um, I have had that one time in uh, in a decade we had one puppy we assume it was a fluke uh, because it's the one and only time it's ever happened and we've had those genetics for probably seven eight years at that time um i would say uh our the biggest thing that we struggle with is a, a smaller trachea um and we have minimized that but it it is something that when you really when what we started with in our English Bulldog lines, it was definitely common. And so as we have, especially in the last three or four years, done more and more breeding, spring in some dogs that have, you know, better air passageways, um, have larger tracheas, that's been, a, that's helped a whole lot. But that has probably been us personally as a breeder, that's probably been our biggest struggle is, is health-wise getting past the, um, the small tracheas and get into dogs that can breathe better. And we're not talking dogs that can't breathe or, uh, you know, having to be put down, but you know, when it's 110 degrees here in the South, uh, we don't want to have to worry about our dogs overheating because they can't get enough air. So that, that's something that's definitely been on our radar for the last three or four years and an emphasis. You, you should never leave them outside unsupervised if it's warm out, especially if they get excited about things, lawnmowers, passing cars, motorcycles, and all those things add into it. I've seen them overheat, like you said, in 70 degrees, just because they're outside playing with the kids. Um, my very, in fact, our very first pair of oldies, I lost the stud dog to heat exhaustion. I, I wasn't at home. 
Um, and the kids were outside playing in a sprinkler, not in the backyard where he was, but on the other side of the fence. And he just wanted to be out there with them. And he was running back and forth along the fence uh, and, and overheated. Um, and we, we lost him. Um, I wasn't out there paying attention. The kids were little, they were toddlers. They didn't know what was going on, but yeah, they, sometimes their, uh, their desire to be with people or their, their desire to uh, be involved is sometimes their own worst enemy because they will, uh, they will overheat themselves just because they, they want to be with their people or want to be involved. Yeah. That's a typical bull breed for sure. They're definitely connected to, to humans more than anything. No doubt. Oh. What is your philosophy behind health testing? I think it's good. It's it's something for the oldie world that is kind of new. Uh, and when I say new, I mean, uh, in the last four, five, six years, it's become um, a lot more common. When I started, uh, it wasn't even on the radar. Um, it may have been out there, but n- nobody was talking about it. It wasn't being done. Um, I think it's great. I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. Uh, especially if you started a kennel, um, you know, before health testing and you built a line and you built a lineage, you can't just scrap all that. Um, you, you've built something there. And so you, you take the health testing and the things that you learn from that and you make better decisions and you make smart breeding decisions and you make improvements. Um, but at the same time, you can't go to somebody who's been breeding for two decades who started when health testing wasn't even a thing, wasn't even an option, who's built something and tell them, Hey, you got to scrap it uh, because now we're going to health test and your dog, you know, your stud dog carries H U U. And so therefore he's, he shouldn't be bred. Well, you, a lot of people don't realize those, those genes, and I'm sure you do. And a lot of your listeners do, but a lot of people who aren't educated don't realize those genes are recessive and you have to stack those genes. There has to be two copies of them for there to be a health concern. And so you can take a dog that carries, um, let's say, HUU, and you can still breed that dog and do so safely. You just shouldn't breed that dog to another dog that carries HUU, especially if those, if those offspring, those puppies, are going to pet homes. They're not going to be bred anyway. So if they carry one copy of the gene, there's no risk of those puppies passing that on to the next generation because they're not being bred. Uh, then using a stud that has all these traits that you need that can really improve the breed in a whole lot of other ways, really bring some things to the table that's hard to find somewhere else. Just find a female that doesn't carry HUU, use him, and then keep the puppies that don't carry HUU as as an example. So I think it's great. Um, It's definitely going to help improve the breed. It's going to, again, minimize more health issues. Um, But I do think some people almost make it a religion when it comes to dog breeding. And when you are dealing with somebody who started before health testing, you know, they, they built something and something that should be respected. And I think it's, it's foolish to set rules for them, especially I see it. Sometimes people set rules that don't even know what they're talking about when it comes to the health testing side of things. It's, we need to be talking to people and listening to people who are experts in the area, in that specific area, to a scientist, not to, um, you know, your internet sleuth, if you know what I mean. My experience has been the same. Oftentimes, those people who are doing the bashing online are not the people who have any experience breeding. Um, not always the case, but oftentimes. Um, and so sometimes before you point the finger, maybe it'd be best to have some experience yourself. Yeah, for sure. And how many of these working dog folks, they just go off by their instincts and what they've seen in the past. Not that I think that that's the way to go. I do think there's a happy medium here, but. Of course. Uh, I, I had a, 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 actually a vet tell me he's a reproductive specialist. I was telling you about, he also has bred multiple champions, um, uh, English bulldogs in the AKC and they, they do all the uh, hip scoring for their stuff as well. And I had him tell me before that, uh, oftentimes hip dysplasia is one of those things that's really tricky uh, because he'll have a dog come in that moves completely fine, uh, has lots of drive off the rear, doesn't seem to have any issues with movement whatsoever. And you do a hip x-ray and the dog would literally be scored as a dog with, with disqualifying hip dysplasia. Not, not fair hips, but we're talking about really bad hips. Um, he says there's a lot more involved in movement and in 
uh, overall function than just the ball and socket. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying or saying we should be breeding dogs that have bad hips, but it's not always as easy as, well, this is what the score was. Um, there's a lot more involved in a dog's overall function. When you're going to keep a puppy, what, what is the selection process like for you? Like, that is a that is the million dollar question. Um, I have been asked I don't know how many times by newer breeders. You know, well, how do you pick your keeper puppies? Um, you know, you learn some things over time that are a good guide or maybe a good indicator. Um, but if I had if I had a dollar for every puppy that I struck out on that I kept. I'd have a few more dollars in the bank. I'll just say that. Or if I had a if I had a quarter for every puppy that I let go that I should have kept, I could probably retire <laughs> because I have let some absolute dandies slip through my fingers um, that are in a pet home somewhere, and I'm thrilled for them and for the dog. But I hate it for myself. I see pictures posted, and I go, "Oh my stars! That guy is gorgeous." I got one back today. I, I knew it when I sold the puppy um, that I should have kept her and I let her go. She's a little less than a year old right now and just absolutely drop dead gorgeous. Abs everything I need right now in my program. But anyway, uh, back to your question. Um, one of the biggest factors I think in choosing your next generation is knowing your, your bloodline um, because different different bloods develop differently. I used a stud that was from the Netherlands that had been imported a few years ago, <clears throat> completely different genetic, something I had never used. I had never seen. I believe he was the first one from this kennel brought over. Uh, this kennel actually is bull force. Um, they do oldies and they also do American bulldogs and a bunch of other things. I believe it was some of the first um, oldie blood from bull force that was brought over. Um, completely different gene pool, um, really heavy American, um, from the looks of the, the dog and the way he produced, I think there was some other stuff mixed in, probably some pit, maybe American bully, that sort of thing would be my guess. I, I, I don't know that for a fact. That would just be my guess. Um, not bashing the dog at all. I still have stuff off the genes, um, that has been really great for me, but it produced completely different than my stuff. Puppies look different when they were born develop different um, and de and oftentimes develop at different rates. Um, and so the biggest thing that I have learned over 10 years, 12 years in, in breeding oldies and picking your next generation is oftentimes you need to be watching what that bloodline looks like at different ages. Um, for instance, the, the example I gave from this dog from the Netherlands, um, the guidance that I was given, because he wasn't my stud, I, it was a stud service situation. The guidance I was given was pick the small, ugly puppies. And I said, you got to be kidding me. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Pick the small, ugly puppies. That's stupid. Who, who picks this? Who wants to keep the ugly puppy? I mean, that goes against everything that you know. They were right. When you looked at those dogs at 12 months, 18 months of age, the ones that were smaller and not quite as, as filled out and girthy as six, eight week old puppies were the dogs you wanted to own. I can't explain it. Um, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's it, that particular stud. That's the way he produced and he did so consistently. Um, my own stuff, I have bred long enough. Uh, over enough litters and enough years that there are certain traits that I look for that I can identify um, as a as a potential. Um, one thing that has helped me the most is if I miss out on a puppy, like a puppy is born and he looks unique, but I don't keep it. I try to keep tabs on it, and I get. I try to find out how does he develop and what does he look like? If, if he was something I didn't keep, but I thought had potential because he looked different. And then I'm impressed with what he turned out into. I will oftentimes repeat that and keep the one that looks like the most like that puppy uh, the next time around that has helped me. 
Um, but I, I guess my biggest piece of advice would be to know your lineage, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Talk to, to the person who, if not originated it, talk to the person who owns the most of it or used the most of it and ask for their guidance on what traits to look for. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the years, it kind of takes a trained eye. Um, I know this because I didn't catch it for years. It took me my first probably three or four years to really get to where I could see it is when you're, when you're looking at the rear of a dog, you know, most people, when they breed a bulldog or they uh, pick a bulldog, all they see is the front half. Okay. That's what bulldogs are known for. Big shoulders, heavy bone, big headpiece, and, and that's what people see. And they oftentimes miss the rear end, which is the motor end of the dog. Um, and there are certain things you look for. Um, you want to see a nice wide hip set, ideally. You don't want a cartoon dog that's all shoulders and narrow in the hips. Now, I'm not saying there aren't a lot of those out there that function well, and I've had a couple throughout the years, so I'm not bashing them, but that's not ideally what you want. You want a dog who's got a really nice wide hip set, but you also want to see the angulation in the rear. You can see it in a puppy. If you have a dog that is peg-legged or a puppy that's peg-legged, they just have straight, just straight from the hip to the to the bottom of the pad. There's no curvature to, to the leg. There's no turn in the stifle. Uh, that's probably a puppy you want to pass on. Uh, top line, one of the things that I look for. When a puppy stands at attention, you want flat or slightly dipping to the rear. You don't want something that's leaning towards the front or low at the shoulder. Um, those are some things you can really identify structure-wise as a puppy. Uh, it's type that, that can be tricky because that changes. Um, I've told some breeders, some of the it's really tempting to get your puppies as fat as possible at eight weeks old because a fat puppy is a cute puppy and is a puppy that sells quicker and sells for more. Okay. I understand it. I get it. I like fat puppies. They're cute. However, a fat puppy can hide a lot more flaws. It's a lot harder to see things on a, on a fat puppy. If you put enough fat and enough rolls and enough skin on a bulldog, especially an oldie, you're going to be convinced that sucker is going to be bully when he grows up. Well, he's going to have all the bulldog features. Well, the problem is he doesn't have bulldog features. He has excess skin and excess fat. And once he grows up, he grows out of that baby fat. All of a sudden that type has changed. Um, and so one of the one of the things that I tell some breeders is don't get your puppies too fat. You don't want them so fat you can't see those things. You, you don't want them so fat that a, a dog that typically would have a four or five inch muzzle looks like he has a nose rope because he's so fat. Um, that's something that I've seen some some breeders make mistakes at, that they get their puppies so fat they can't tell the difference. Um, I look for uh, cheekbones in my puppies. I want to... I, I heard a breeder describe it one time. It, I want them to look like they have two golf balls in their mouth, in their cheeks. Uh, that might be a little excessive. You see that sometimes in American bulldog puppies. Um, but a puppy that typically has cheekbones out, uh, out the side of the head makes her head look round instead of that square head. Um, that's something that I definitely look for. I look for muzzle type. Muzzle type to me is important. Um, I am not a fan of a snipey muzzle, that longer, narrower, pointed muzzle. Um, you see it a lot more in oldies. Um, one of the reasons you see it is because of the belief that that muzzle breathes better, which is not the case. Um, trachea and soft palate is what causes breathing issues. One of the worst breathing dogs I ever owned probably had the longest muzzle of any dog I ever owned uh, because she had palate issues. It has, it's not always about the length of muzzle. Sometimes they go hand in hand, but that's not a sure thing. One of the cleanest breathing dogs I ever owned had a really smashed, beautiful square muzzle. Um, and that's, that's a trait that I desire. So it's something that, that I look for in, in a puppy. If, if I have two puppies that are almost identical, had this in one of my last litters that I kept a pup, kept a, a female out of two puppies that were, almost identical. The deciding factor for me was one puppy had a square muzzle than the other. And that's something you can see on an eight, nine, 10 week old puppy pretty clear. You can see whether it's got a more square boxy muzzle, whether it's more snipey, it comes more to a point at the front. So those are some things that I see that I 
I look for when I pick puppies, but it is by no means an exact science. <laughs> and uh, I would say that uh, I, I'm probably more successful than unsuccessful, but it's not a wide margin. Uh, I, I've failed yeah. plenty of times. Advice do you give uh, potential customers of yours that have never owned a, a, a bulldog before? Uh, and is there any scenarios where you might turn somebody away? That's a great question. I do. Um, I have turned some people away a time or two. Um, not If I don't get into turning people away just because they're difficult, if there are some people who are just not a right fit for my dogs. And, and I'm okay with that. And I try to tell people that up front. There's enough variation in the oldie breed that sometimes people come to me looking for a puppy and what they want from their dog, they would not get well from one of mine. Um, I used the analogy earlier of the linebacker and wide receiver. I have people that come to me sometimes and say, look, I want a, I want a running buddy. I do 10 mile runs or half marathons. And I stop them right then and there. And I say, look, my dogs are not for you. <laughs> you, you will get a mile or two down the road and then you'll be carrying them. Um, and they say, well, I thought these were old English bulldogs. They're supposed to be athletic and, and they are, but they're not bred. To, mine are not bred to, to go run 10 miles. They're heavy boned, heavy muscled, uh, very girthy. Uh, they run around the yard, do great for, you know, 30, 45 minutes, chasing tennis ball, playing with the kids, chasing Frisbees. Uh, they'll jump a four foot fence. I mean, they're plenty athletic, uh, but I will turn people away if they tell me they want a running buddy and I'll tell them to go call another breeder or two that I know that has dogs that are bred for, for doing that. Um, and, and I'm not ashamed of that. That's just, that's what we go for. Uh, and so I just own it. And I try to try to be upfront with, with people about that as well. So there are some, some puppy buyers who I have turned away due to that, that they wanted something from their dogs that I felt pretty confident my dogs could not fulfill for them. Um, advice I give puppy breed or puppy owners, new puppy owners. Um, this will probably sound funny and I don't mean it funny, but it, it uh, it's honestly advice I give. If you do not want your dog to sleep in bed with you, do not ever let them in in the first place. <laughs> because once you let them in, they will expect it and they will make your life miserable until you give in. Um, most new puppy owners bring their puppy home. They put it in the crate its first night and it cries and cries and cries. And the first, oh, we can't take this. We can't stand it. Bring him to bed. Well, you have just lost the war. Um, he will take over your bed. I don't know how many clients I have who call me three or four years later and they bought two or three dogs from me and they say, I had to move out of my bed with my wife and I'm now sleeping on the couch because the dogs have taken over the bed. Um, it, that literally is, that advice is in my paperwork that I send home with every puppy on my new puppy recommendations. If you don't want the dog sleeping with you, don't ever let them in the bed to start with. <laughs> um, but as far as breed specific, I would say um, biggest advice is oldies are a definite uh, improvement, like with heat um, sensitivity over English bulldogs, but they are still a bulldog. And people need to be careful with their oldies, especially if you live in the South. Uh, they can handle heat better than your regular English bulldog, but they will overheat. Um, you got to be careful. You got to keep an eye on them. Um, my dogs are kenneled outside. Uh, I live here in Oklahoma. Uh, yesterday, the heat index here was 112 degrees. So they can take the heat, but they have a unique setup. They have a, a unique, we have a unique kennel setup in order to accommodate them. So if they were just stuck out in the middle of the sunshine in 112 degree heat index, they would die. They, they're not going to be able to take that. Um, we have a shade system. We have a mister system. We have fan system. Um, and, and we keep them outside for a reason. They're, they're supposed to be able to take that. But at the same time, uh, we recognize they still have, um, they still have restrictions. They, they still have limitations. Um, so if, if you get an, an oldie of, from basically anybody, um, recognize they are more heat tolerant, but they're not a greyhound. Um, there's a reason they don't resemble a greyhound. There's a re reason they don't resemble some of your, your shepherding dogs that can go run all day long in, in 100 degrees. They are heavy boned, heavy muscled, girthy dogs, and that body structure takes a lot more time to cool, it takes a lot more effort to cool. And then you mix into that, that short muzzle, 
uh, the short muzzle plays a big factor in their their limited ability to cool. There's so many cooling centers. That's why you have the panting from dogs. That's how they cool themselves. That shorter muzzle, they have less ability to cool through that panting process. Uh, so if you, an old, if you own an oldie, just recognize they're heat sensitive. Uh, they are heat more heat tolerant, but they are heat sensitive. Be careful. Um, keep things like lemon juice and other things on hand you can use if you if you get in a bind and you get an overheated dog. But the uh, best thing to do is just keep them from overheating to start with. The first piece of advice I give to people who ask me about, about breeding is to find a mentor. There's not a book or a college out there that's going to give you the education you need to, to raise old English bulldogs and be successful at it. It's, you need someone to guide you. Um, and I don't say that because I'm trying to you know, get people to, to ask me. Frankly, it takes a lot of effort and time to, to be a mentor to someone, but um, I feel like that's what really, one thing that really set me apart and helped me to be successful is I found someone who was already successful, um, who was willing to give me guidance, and I listened. Um, there's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I can listen and take advice and put that into practice. And Chris Moore did that for me. Um, he didn't have to. I didn't. In fact, I didn't even buy a dog from him at that time. Uh, did later on. Um, but he taught me so much uh, because I was ignorant. Most people who get in the dog game are ignorant. That's okay. Uh, just admit it and own it and find someone who's not. Um, but don't just find anybody. Find someone who's being successful, um, who has some integrity. There's a, I'm going to be careful how I say this. Um, like any, uh, like, like any industry, there are people in the dog business who don't have the highest ethics, find someone who's ethical, who has a good reputation and find someone whose program you look at and you think, I want mine to be something like that. Doesn't have to be identical. You don't want to copy somebody, but be something like that. And so many people who get in, they call me for advice and they do 80% of the talking and people like that. I don't normally help because they're more interested in trying to impress me or whatever the reason is, and they're not there to learn. Um, find somebody who can mentor, mentor you would be the first thing um, that I would recommend to anybody. Find someone who's good. Um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry, my, I had a brain lapse. Yeah, no problem. It, what advice do you give as far as... Um... You know, do you start out with a couple of females or do you start out with a stud or one on one? What, what's, uh, what's your thoughts on by, behind that? Great question. Stud dogs garner a whole lot of attention. Kennels are built on females. Um, that's the simplest way I know to put it. Uh, stud dogs get all the attention in the world on social media and everywhere else. When somebody wants to buy a puppy, they want to see what the dad looks like and how impressive he is. Typically, most breeders will tell you, and my experience falls somewhere in, in the same line of thought, is that mom dominates the gene pool, typically to the tune of 60 to 70 percent. So you can, what that means is you can have the greatest, coolest looking stud dog on earth, but if your female is a piece of junk, you're probably going to make slightly better pieces of junk because she dominates the gene pool. Um, stud dog can only do so much in that process. Um, so my advice is to get a really nice female or two and start there. And everybody wants to start with the, uh, you know, an adult female. And there are some advantages of that, but the question, why is a breeder getting rid of her in the first place? Uh, typically, if you find a breeder who's really high quality, has high quality dogs, it's best to get them to start there. Um, stud dog is great for the marketing process, uh, but they they don't do as much when it comes to to actually influencing your love influence in your kennel. The idea of breeding and, and uh, how to sustain a program and and provide good dogs to the to the public, right? Uh, it's almost kind of an embarrassing 
a question and topic to bring up with a lot of people because there's so much backlash behind it, especially these days with the political agenda. And that's the business behind breeding. I am a free market kind of guy. I believe in if you're going to do something and you're going to do it right, you should probably get compensated for it. And the more you're, you're compensated for it, the better outcomes I think a breeder will have. You know, if you're sure. putting all your time and effort and the reward isn't coming back to you in some sort of way, we're all kind of selfish in nature. I mean, that's just what a human being is. And, and we have mouths to feed and, 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 and houses to keep up and all that sort of thing. So how do you balance the business side with the human side? That's a, that's a great question and a very hard question. Um, yeah, especially when you get on social media, you're right. People will just eat you alive um, in some forums or some groups. Um, and like you said, with the whole spay and neuter craze, um, which I'm not against in some circumstances. Um, here's the thing that I think really breeders have going for them is that we're providing something not only that people want, but we're providing something that helps people. Um you can get online and you can read about PTSD. You can read about special needs kids. You can read about all kinds of stuff. And you're going to find some of the things that helps them the most is when they have a companion animal, a service animal to help them through to deal with different things. We're bringing happiness and joy to people's life. And a, as a breeder, being compensated, we're able to do that better by by using science, by using our experience to breed and produce dogs that function better, that last longer, that are healthier, that exhibits the traits that we need. Um, frankly, not in, in a lot of cases, your average mutt isn't going to do well in some of those situations. People who breed for a pet breed for a specific temperament for a dog that can handle specific situations uh, a working dog can't handle those things. And we're providing something that people need, that people want. Now, is it a life necessity? No, I'm not going to sit here and try to sell that. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of work and effort goes into this. And there are so many people that I see that have gotten puppies from us, gotten puppies from other people, and their lives are better. Uh, does a bulldog make their life, um, does it make it worth living? No. But uh, people, you know, th there may be some political circles where that's uh, politically incorrect. But if I'm doing something that helps provide for my family and brings happiness into other people's families, that's not illegal and that we're doing it in an ethical way, I'm not going to apologize for that. And, you know, if, if people's politics or reasonings disagree with that, that's fine. They're welcome to their opinion. Um, but I feel like we're doing something that's, that's good. Uh, we enjoy it. It's good for our kids. It teaches them responsibility. They learn about biology and ecology. Um, we, uh, actually taught a filled in recently in a, uh, teaching a high school ag class about animal reproduction, um, through some of the things that I've learned and that we've practiced and we did semen evaluation and, and uh, all kinds of different things. And it was a really educational experience. And it was something that I was able to do because of what I've learned through this process. Um, and whether people want to admit it or not, that's what this is. It's, it's a agricultural based thing. Um, people don't want to admit that, but that's what it is. And so I guess so uh, my defense for what we do is that we are providing for ourselves and we're bringing something to our society that our society wants and that we believe is helping people, making people happier and enriching their lives. And, you know, I can be happy about that. That's something that, that I'm proud to say that I think we do. And on those lines, how is the current state of affairs with the economy affected your program? It has definitely slowed down. Um, COVID was you know, a real shot in the arm. People had money and people had excess money. Um, and so they were spending it on all kinds of things, including puppies. Um, the slowdown has been hard. It's also exacerbated. This is one of the things that does 
I wish there was a better solution in dog breeding, and that is when new breeders get in. I am not opposed to new breeders. I was one at one time. Everybody has been. Uh, but people see dollar signs sometimes, people who maybe need some excess income somewhere to help them pay some bills, and they think, well, we'll just get two dogs and you know, have a litter of puppies and everything will be fine. Um, and I'm not knocking anybody for thinking like that. I have thought like that in the past. So no judgment whatsoever from me on, on that front. But that's an uneducated way of looking at things. And there are repercussions for that. And, and our current economy is now suffering from that. The dog, the dog economy is because we had so many people who saw, who bought dogs during COVID and right after the pandemic when uh, our country was still flush with money. And they thought, well, hey, man, we'll spend two, three, four, five thousand dollars on a dog and then we'll get two of them and then we'll make our money back plus some. And now that the economy has gone down, that excess money is no longer available and people's budget are tightening up. We also have a glutton of puppies on the market because people who bought dogs one, two, three years ago are now putting their first batch of puppies out. And I wish there was a mechanism or maybe maybe not a mechanism, but maybe more uh, public advice circulating for people who want to get into breeding to get some mentorship so that they recognize the consequences and the amount of time it takes to build a brand. We've been doing this for 10 years and we have a brand built. Um, we spent time developing our dogs, marketing our dogs, and so what we sell a puppy for today and the ease with which we might or might not sell it is not applicable to somebody who just got in. Um, and so there are things like that that people don't realize. You know, we put our time in building a brand and, and we are benefiting from that. Also struggling with the downturn in the economy. But there are there are these other things like the glut in the market right now with so many puppies because people didn't realize what they were getting into didn't realize the consequences of what they're doing and also didn't realize they weren't going to make the same amount of money that people who have done this for decades are making. Um, so it's, it's a struggle. Um, I mean, we're doing okay. We market and our dogs sell themselves for the most part, but it's definitely not what it was two or three years ago. We, uh, we are slowing down litters. I mean, before we were, having litters so fast it was making me older than I wanted to be <laughs> but uh, we are we're definitely slowing that down uh, the price for puppies has come way down some of the the prices for puppies in during COVID and the two years afterwards was just astronomical uh, we're, we're talking double sometimes triple not in the holy market but in some of the other markets I mean you were seeing um, you were seeing French bulldogs sell left and right for eight to ten thousand dollars uh, which is just unfathomable to me. Uh, you know, my average oldie sells for two to three thousand dollars. The market has probably come down between twenty and fifty percent from in the last eighteen months, be my guess, and in price. So, uh, yeah, we compensate for it there. We compensate for it and cut costs like anybody does. Um, you know, we we have a budget that that we have to meet, and sometimes we have to cut things out of that budget. Um, my wife and I have those conversations pretty regular. So she says, well, I'm having to take this out. What are you taking out this month? So <laughs> it's uh, like owning any business. You got to make smart business decisions. And that's one thing that um, when you asked earlier about kennel advice, that's one other thing I tell people, be smart. Um, you need business sense along with the dog knowledge to do well uh, in running a kennel. It is. It's an agricultural business for sure. Um is there been any thought about like kind of a thinking outside the box alternative ideas of, of being able to still be marketable and, and successful and, and also fulfill the, the, the current economy? Like, you know, I've heard some banter about puppy financing and stuff like that. That's a great question. Wow. There are, there's actually a company or two out there that does that you can reach out to the, um, you can kind of partner with. Um, I have chosen not to do that up to this point. Uh, the market had been good enough that I wasn't forced to, and we hope to not do that. Um, it would broaden the market. It's, I will say this, and, and I don't mean this derogatory towards anyone whatsoever, but the lower price range you get into with 
any product, this is not just dogs, but with any product, the more difficult the customer base. Um, the guy who shows up on a Kia lot to buy a Kia is going to give the salesman a harder time than the guy who shows up on a Ferrari lot. Because the guy who's buying a Ferrari doesn't care that it costs him $250,000. He's going to walk in and he's going to write a check for $250,000 because he wants a Ferrari. The guy buying the Kia has a wife, kids at home. He's got bills he's trying to pay. And so he's going to try to save every dime he can on that Kia. Completely understand it. I've been that guy and am that guy. But also being a business owner, those people are much more difficult to work with and to keep happy. Um, and so you, you have to, at times, again, I'm not knocking anyone. This is just, this is business 101. Um, I, I'm the buyer that nobody wants to deal with too. So, uh, no judgment whatsoever. Um, but we market ourselves as a bulldog breeder. I tell people I, I sell Cadillacs. I don't sell Kias. Um, and so the financing side of it for our business model is kind of a conflict. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I do tell people who want to make payments, I say, well, if you want to start ahead of time and put a deposit down on a puppy before they're born and make payments and you can make those payments up to the time the puppy reaches eight weeks old, I'm willing to do that. You know, we're looking at, you know, four months from the time a breeding takes place till the puppy goes home. Uh, but to extend out further than that, yeah, you're, that just doesn't really fit my business model. Um, but there is a market for it because there is a company or two out there that is beginning to do pet financing. Um, in reference to your general question, are we thinking outside the box? Yes, we are thinking outside the box at ways to, to do, uh, to make some more money. We've actually considered doing, um, consulting, uh, for people who do want to breed, um, I, I am a little conflicted on that, to be honest. Um, I have always given advice to a certain degree without charging, um, but I get do get more and more requests for it. And it is a knowledge that I have that I've invested in financially to obtain. And so we've considered offering that as a as something for people, you know, hey, we'll give you an hour consultation, anything you want to know about dogs, and it's $100 for the hour, uh, things like that. Um, still debating that, still trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, one, I really struggle with that. Uh, probably my biggest struggle is the ethical side of it. Not that I have any problem with consulting, um, but it was freely given to me um, when, when I got in this and I found Chris and he helped me. Um, he didn't charge me for that. And I'm so grateful for that. I almost every time I talk to him, I wouldn't be where I am without him. Um, and so I was freely given and I, I almost feel obligated to continue to freely give at the same time. I also have an obligation to feed my family. So, <laughs> um, still debating that, still debating that and, and thinking that through and want to do the right thing one way or the other. One way that you could do it is, set up like a Patreon and just go by subject by subject and where you're not really speaking to one individual, but you're speaking to your subscribers and then charge a higher rate for a zoom meeting or something on those lines where you can sit down for a couple hours and, and uh, a good idea. speak with 10 people and, and they can ask you questions in two hours and that's it. You're done. And, you do that once a week and that costs them 30 bucks a month or something like that. So it's a reoccurring and it's still not to the point where you're charging, you know, a hundred dollars an hour, but you, you are getting compensated and you are providing edutainment on top of everything else. So that's a great idea. I'm going to check into that. It it's time consuming. And, and the more you get into this sort of thing, the, you know, the more you, it will take up your time, but you know, it's it's a creative outlet on top of everything else, and then you're providing a service. It's, it's just another outlet. Right, right. Yeah. Good ideas. Good ideas. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just a couple more quick questions. Um, if it wasn't old English Bulldogs or if you had unlimited time and money and space, 
what would be the second breed? Oh, what a question. What a question. I have done English Bulldogs as well. Absolutely love them as a breed. I don't know that I would breed them. Um, I really, really struggled. We had, I don't know, four or five litters and just really struggled with the puppy raising process, which uh, I, th I think it was the dogs that I purchased. Um, I, I did the thing that I said not to do, which was I bought adults um, and they were really, really nice adults. Um, but as I said before, breeders who get rid of really nice dogs that still have significant breeding potential typically do so for a reason. <laughs> and apparently the ones I got couldn't produce milk. And uh, we really, really struggled with the puppies. A puppy that's hand raised and bottle fed never looks as good as a puppy that is, um, you know, raised by mama who has really good high quality milk. So I guess if I could just have them as pets, it'd probably be an English bulldog. Absolutely love them. Absolutely love them. Um, don't know that I would breed them again because it was, it was so hard and just was really not successful at it. Um, I have some friends that have French bulldogs and I know they're the craze right now. So this even referencing them almost makes me feel dumb, but, um, I just, I think they're the funniest things ever. Um, they're a little bit too much high energy for me. Um, just go, 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 go. But they're like a little comedian running around. So there's a part of me that thinks it would be really cool to have a bunch of little comedians running around, but I'm sure that my, my short patience would run out very quickly. and I would not be thrilled. That's the thing I love about English bulldogs is, you know, you, it doesn't require a lot of patience. They're just going to, yeah. they're going to chill on the couch and watch Rocky three with you. You know, they're, they're yeah. not going to require anything of effort. I might go back to, to Mastiffs if money wasn't an issue and, and, uh, you know, all the things that could be struggled were gone. I, the masters were cool. Um, they kind of had a similar temperament to the oldies. Um, really great with kids. They were so big. They kind of worried you with the kids a little bit. Um, but I just loved them. They were, they were one of those dogs, you know, that you go out somewhere and people are like, wow, look at that. That is a, that's an awesome looking dog, you know, and then mm -hmm. they're, they look so intimidating, but they're just so friendly. Um, so that it would probably, if I was actually going to breed, I'd probably go with the, with English Mastiff again. Is there anything that we didn't convey that you'd like uh, like to to share now? Or man, I think we covered everything. That was a yeah. That was a pretty uh, pretty broad uh, discussion. I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. I don't, I don't get to talk dogs that much. My wife kind of rolls her eyes after about five minutes of talking dogs yeah. with me. She's like, "Ah, go find somebody else." <laughs> so yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. It's been a fun conversation. No, I appreciate it, and I, um, I thank you for uh, for sharing, and uh, maybe we can have you on again if there's something that you'd like to share in the future, or um, we can do a round two. I do have one question that just popped up. Uh, what is the future of your kennel? What, where do you see yourself in five years with your with your program? That is a great question. We um, we continue to proceed. As our plan is to keep going. Um, we're going to put quite a bit of effort into marketing. We haven't had to do that the last few years. So from the business side of things, we're definitely going to be doing some marketing. We've been doing a social media campaign pretty significant for the last week or two, uh, videos and things like that. We got on TikTok, which uh, for a guy who doesn't do social media was completely um, mind blowing. I'll just say the least, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. we, um, we're going to spend the next couple of years really focused on as far as the actual breeding processes. We're going to try to bring in some dogs that are a little more, um, we want to keep all the traits that we have now, but we want to minimize some of the excess skin like to, for your average person. We want to minimize the squishy dogs and bring in the hard dogs. We want, we want muscle and we want hard muscle. Um, but without losing the bulldog look, we're not trying to get, we're not trying to bring in, um, American bullies. We love the American bully body type, not the head type. Um, 
So, and we've done that. We've, we've got two or three in the making. Um, I posted one actually on our social media today of one we produced last year and she just about perfectly exhibits what we're going for. Tight skin, heavy muscles, still got really nice bone, got that bulldog headpiece. Um, but we feel like that's going to function a little bit better. Um, we love the English bulldog flavor that we've had for years. Um, but we want to migrate a little bit more towards something that has a little bit more of an athlete look and a little bit less of the couch potato look. We don't want to completely do away with it. We just want to transition a little bit more towards uh, that more. Ath- I, when I say athletic, I don't mean lean in the sense of like thin. I mean, just less fat, more muscle tone. Um, and so that's, that's kind of going to be our focus. I next think over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and I think we've got some cool stuff in the works to bring that on. Awesome. 